Bullet to Veteran Podcast. Thank you for your service. All right, everybody, welcome back to Bulletproof Veteran Podcast. I am honored again today because for the second time since I started this podcast, I have just the privilege to sit down with SEAC retired John Wayne Troxel. Now, if you've heard me talk in the past, this is somebody that I respect, okay? And it's not so much that I respect exactly what he says because we all agree, disagree on different topics. I respect the man as a leader because he takes these different topics and hits them from a leadership perspective. He doesn't shy away from them. He's willing to talk. He's willing to come on the show, all that stuff. You never see him. If you've seen him do drinking bros, if you've seen him sit down with other podcasts, listen, he's got his opinions and he wants to talk. So I want to give him a forum to talk a little bit about Afghanistan today. So, sir, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Brother, it's an honor to be back. And, uh, you know, again, I got to give you props. You have the absolute baddest ass studio on any podcast I've been on. So your WASTA is up here as always, brother. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm going to pass that along to my dad because most of this was built in his garage. So uh, I know he, he would love to hear that. <laughs> awesome. It's Definitely. an honor to be here again. That's uh, great. And listen, some people have heard you on the show before. They've heard you on other podcasts. But for anybody who hasn't and maybe doesn't know that much about you, Please tell us a little bit about your life. I mean, you, you rose to the highest ranks in the enlisted. So you, you've, had, you've had an interesting one, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, I served in the U.S. Army for one month shy of 38 years. I was a reconnaissance guy growing up, spent a lot of time in the 82nd Airborne Division uh, in the striker community. And uh, I served as the third senior enlisted advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and Secretary of Defense from 2015 to 2019. And, um, and I retired in 2019, turned over the reins to CZ Colon Lopez, my good friend, who's the current SEAC. Mm -hmm. And since then, I've opened uh, my own consulting company. And I consult or serve as a brand ambassador or I'm a strategic advisor for nine different corporations. I support seven different foundations. And my focus is to continue to be an enabler for the current uh, active force and their families, but also to support our veterans and their families as well. And that's really why I wanted to have you back on the show. We're in a weird time right now. I mean, if you would have told me yeah. when I was serving or when I got out, I got out in 06, uh, I'm sorry, 05, I apologize, 05. Um, the world was very different then. Um, and over the past three months, and especially the past week, a lot has happened in Afghanistan. Um, I've done a couple shows on it. I had Colonel Miska on. I also did a show just on how we could help interpreters and how people could get involved and help out anybody that was trying to go through the, uh, the special immigrant visa program, um, you know, reaching out to their Congress people, whatever the case may be. I wanted to have you on because I feel there's a lack of focus on what the veterans are going through. Uh, seeing this, what the military is dealing with on the ground right now and what those men and women are going to have to come home with and a voice of leadership amongst the normal population so that they understand what's going on and why it's going on. Um, because yeah. again, this didn't happen over a week. This is a long time coming. What's, what's been going on. Um, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience in Afghanistan first, just so we know where you're coming from? Uh, I know you did at least one combat deployment there, but yeah. you also were a SEAC, so you, 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 know, you, you went over there yeah, multiple so, times. Yeah, so I served as the command senior enlisted leader of the International Security Assistance Forces Joint Command, the three-star headquarters, in 2011 and 12. I was responsible for day-to-day -day combat operations in all combat forces in Afghanistan. I did that for a year, which is you know, and I'll get into that here. That's when we initially started the withdrawal mm -hmm. was when I was there. And then uh, as the SEAC, I made 10 different trips to Afghanistan with the chairman, with the secretary of defense and by myself. So I uh, spent a lot of time there and, uh, and focused a lot of effort there, especially when I was there for a year in Afghanistan, I made it to every province in the country, patrolled with every battalion size organization 
U.S. and multinational. So I, uh, I, I was really uh, pretty well. I was pretty well versed on what was going on in Afghanistan and the challenges associated with being there. Yeah. Now, as far as your counterparts, your Afghani counterparts, um, how was your interaction with uh, different special forces units, your interpreters, all that kind of stuff? So it was phenomenal. I, uh, when I came there in 2011, the Afghan army was the only service and they had a Sergeant major of the army and his name was Rashan Safi. And, uh, so he was kind of my counterpart there for a year, along with the ground forces command, uh, uh, command Sergeant major Hafiz al Um, those are the two guys I kind of partnered with and they went with me as I traveled around and uh, visited U.S. coalition and Afghan forces. So at that point in time in 2011, you know, we were, the Afghan army was moving in the right direction. We were getting them outfitted. We were doing recruiting to get uh, young soldiers in and everything. And the key thing we were doing was getting them educated because when we came in the country in 2001, uh, less than 40% or around 40% of the whole country was literate. 7% of the female population. And 10 years later, now we were 70% of the population was literate and almost half of all girls and women were literate at that time. So we were going in the right direction in 2011. And those were the guys that I kind of partnered with. And when you were in that role and then in your role as SEAC, you know, in the 10 times that you went back, what were, what were your feelings about how the drawdown was going? Because like you said, this started in 2011, 2012 timeframe. Was it a positive experience, do you think? Or, you know, did you already kind of see on the horizon that there might be problems here? So when, when you put Afghanistan in perspective, you have to think back. Um, it was a monarchy for decades. You know, they had a king and everything. Mm-hmm. And, you know, all of a sudden, in 1973, the monarchy kind of went away. And then in 1979, the Russians invaded. And for 10 years, uh, under Russian rule, uh, the people were very oppressed. And the uh, Northern Alliance, or the Mujahideen at the time, under Ahmed Shah Massoud, the Lion of the Panjshir, was the ones that were really fighting the Russians and taking the fight to them. Russia left in 1989. And in that vacuum, you know, the Taliban came to power and Massoud continued to fight the Taliban uh, until he was uh, executed and murdered by Al Qaeda two days before 9-11. That's not a coincidence that Massoud in Afghanistan uh, was murdered and two days later, 9-11 happened. And uh, because Al Qaeda and the Taliban did not want the U.S. in Ahmed Shah Massoud to be partners, okay? But anyway, so as we came in initially into Afghanistan, it was to get Osama bin Laden. I think everybody knows that. Uh, and the Taliban live there. They are Pashtun in, you know, a Pashtun tribe. And they live by this Pashtun Wali. I must protect my friends at all costs. And bin Laden was someone that they welcomed in and they were going to protect him and defend him, which is why we got there in the first place. And because the Taliban, when they were in power, were allowing for these uh, terrorist training camps to grow and develop and give them the ability to export spectacular attacks to Western Europe, but also to the United States, 9-11, we knew that Afghanistan could not be a haven for these kind of terrorists. So for the 10 years we went to try and get uh, bin Laden, we were also building the Afghan government and the Afghan military so they could take the fight to the Taliban and defend their own sovereignty. As we continued to see in 2011, President Obama said, hey, we're gonna go from 130,000 after the surge to 120,000. And when I was there 31 December, 2011, we had to get 10,000 troops out you know, by, by that date per the president's order. And we did that, but you know, the troops were kicking and screaming because they wanted to stay there and fight and support the mission. But we got down to 120,000. And then over the course of the years, we went from under 100,000 uh, down to when I became the SEAC, we were at 15,000. So we had the steady, orderly, protracted, disciplined withdrawal going on that was allowing time and space for the Afghans 
to not only continue to get after governance, even though there was a lot of corruption, and to this day, there was a lot of corruption. The Afghan military continuing to build, and not only did we build the Afghan army, we built an Afghan air force. And we were continuing to give the Afghans time and space to grow. And, you know, from when I, the first year I was the SEAC till I left, we went from 15,000 to 8,400 to eventually the number of 2,500. And albeit that the Taliban was empowered uh, and were still fighting in a viable threat, the Afghan government and President Ghani was still in power. The Afghan military was still in control of every uh, province in Afghanistan, and they were taking the fight to the Taliban. So we had this, like I said, disciplined, orderly, protracted withdrawal going on. And I felt on 14 April, when the president made the decision that we're getting out. Now you have to think for 20 years, we have lived by the word Shona ba Shona with our Afghan partners, which means shoulder to shoulder. Mm -hmm. We have continued to tell the Afghans, we will stay shoulder to shoulder. And when we only have 2,500 folks there, the vast majority of them were not fighting. They were doing security force assistance. They were building partner capacity. We had a, a small counterterrorism contingent that was continuing to get after Taliban, Al Qaeda, and ISIS high value targets and assisting the Afghans at getting after that. We were providing air power and intelligence and logistics that were helping, but the vast majority of the troops weren't fighting. And we had not had a death in a year and a half. Well, you have to think so a lot of it had to be logistics too. I mean, it had to be a, a, absolutely. a, a huge logistics contingency uh, just at Bagram. I mean, it, it, that's yeah. basically all it was at that point. Yeah. And, but, you know, so after 14 April, I felt that, you know, to, to kind of use a football game as an analogy, mm -hmm. we started on our own goal line back in 2001, you know, because of 9-11 and everything. And us and the Afghan security forces, we started this moving the ball. And we were moving the ball. We got across midfield and we got down to about the 10-yard line or the five-yard line. And with the clock running, all of a sudden we decided instead of continuing to push forward and put it in the end zone, we're, us and the Afghans, we're just going to come off the playing field. And when the referee blew the whistle, the Taliban picked up the ball, went 90 yards in the other direction for a touchdown. And so here's where we're at now, where the Taliban are in charge. And it pains me to see that we have to ne negotiate with an insidious terrorist organization in order to get our U.S. citizens out, our trusted Afghans out, and any third nation or third country nationals that want to get out as well. Yeah, that's the scary thing is, is like I'm watching, you know, I'm trying to stay in touch with different organizations that are trying to help right now. There are organizations that I've talked about on the show previously. And, and the videos that you see of a mother passing a baby, uh, you know, and just saying, hey, just just take my baby. You know, I, I, yeah. I know it will. I know the baby will be better off with somebody that I have no idea who this person is than if they stay here under Taliban rule. When yeah. you, I mean, I'm a father. I can't even, there's, there's no experience in my entire life that would make me think that that would be the best decision. But for these people, they know it's their only chance of survival. And it's just heartbreaking yeah. when you see these videos, it's heartbreaking. Well, and then we've seen it for 20 years that, the Taliban will uh, sexually abuse young boys and girls. Yep. And if, it, and if that baby was a girl, uh, the only life she would have under the Taliban was, would be oppression. And then at nine years old, she will either become a Taliban fighter wife or a Taliban fighter sex slave. Yep. And so the, the normal Afghan citizens know that. And, and they know that if I give my baby off to the Americans, that they're going to have a better life. And, uh, and that in some, the, the vast majority of the American public cannot understand that. But when you live under oppressive rule by an insidious terrorist organization, uh, the decision making of some citizens in there um, can, can be harsh to the average American citizen on what they're doing, like put their baby over the wire and everything. Well, and that's the thing, something that I truly believe and, and is always hard for me to 
to, to talk to people about is when I see people in this country bash the rights that we have or, or the society that we've built over the you know, past almost 300 years, and they say how oppressive it is and, and, and all of this, it's like, you don't see anybody in the United States tossing their baby into Canada. Right. So you don't have it. You can't even comprehend what real oppression is. There might be many oppressions here in the United States. And don't get me wrong. We have not gotten it right. I will be the first to admit that. Yeah. But we are not even in the same stratosphere of what these people have gone through. And they know where they're going back to. Yeah. And it's horrible. Well, and that's why, you know, I, I am very, uh, you know, I... <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm very pissed off that the president made this decision. Mm -hmm. um, very pissed off because <clears throat> those of us that have served in Afghanistan and, and for that matter, in places like Iraq or wherever we've had to fight these terrorists um, know that <clears throat> with the Taliban in control, Al Qaeda, they're already there. ISIS is already there. They're going to continue to build numbers. They're going to continue to build capability. And they are going to look to export terrorist attacks around the country. And um, that's what a lot of veterans are upset about. That for 20 years, there had not been a planned, prepared, exported, and executed terrorist attack in the United States since 9-11. Now, don't get me wrong. There have been inspired attacks mm -hmm. that have happened in the country. Low like in Orlando. Stuff. Yeah, absolutely, brother. You know, yeah. Orlando was a good example of an inspired kind of terrorist attack. San Bernardino was another one, but none that had originated from outside the United States because of the pressure we were putting on these terrorist organizations. And I will tell you, as much as the American public, and I hear it all the time, and God bless our citizens. I love them. They support the military so much. But when they say, we just want all the troops to come home. In this day and age, in this world we live in, we can't bring all the troops home if we want to defend our freedom, our homeland, and our way of life. Because we have uh, near-peer kind of threats like China and Russia that are looking to gain competitive advantages over us and uh, in, in all elements of national power. But these terrorists are not going to go away if we just leave them alone. They are going to continue to try and attack Western innocent targets. So we in the military, and we have to continue to educate uh, our, our citizens that we have to be an, an expeditionary military to protect our homeland and our interests abroad. Otherwise, 20 years from now, you know, one of the things I fear is 20 years from now, my grandson, his child could be speaking Chinese if we don't get this right, you know, mm -hmm. and that's not a slight on on the Chinese people, it's a slight on the Chinese Communist Party that has this 100-year marathon where they want to take over the world. Yeah. And then these terrorists, my fear is if we give them time and space to build, their, the next terrorist attack may be at the Mall of the Americas in Minneapolis or some of, you know, the Omni in Atlanta or somewhere like that where innocent people are just doing and exercising their freedom. So that's why... I'm so upset about this because now we've given the Taliban not only $80 billion worth of military equipment, uh, the best military equipment in the world, but we've also given them, you know, the time and space and, and their, their uh, brethren, terrorist organizations like Al Qaeda and ISIS, the opportunity to continue to build capability that could be a threat, not only to our allies in Europe, but certainly to our homeland. Yeah. And, I, I have to echo something that you just said. The, the, the mass populace does not understand, you know, the, I saw a meme the other day that I think summed it up and I, I don't want to just quote memes, but it, it really did sum it up. So it, it, it was right. Yeah. Everybody went from a infectious disease expert to a tactical expert overnight <laughs> because all of a sudden this was the next thing that was in their face. And now everybody has an opinion and everybody thinks they know how the military works. We have not been a bring the troops home since before World War II. Right. Since World War II, we have been an expeditionary force. We have had people yeah. in Europe, Africa, 
and Southeast Asia since then. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, yeah. so the idea that we would just leave Afghanistan and everybody would come home, that's not the way our military works. And that's not how geopolitics work nowadays. If you just take everybody out of Eastern Europe, well, what's Russia going to do? A absolutely. Right? A absolutely. Yeah. If yeah. you take everybody out of South Korea, what's North Korea going to do? Now, South yeah. Korea might be uh, okay because they, they, they have kind of you know, solidified themselves over the years as have Japan and other countries, but they wouldn't have right after the Korean War. So there's a reason that we posture ourselves in certain ways to maintain our readiness and the kind of, like you said, that pressure on our would-be enemies. Like, hey, we're right next to you. Don't fucking do that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then I, I will tell you, so yesterday I was seeing comments and I was receiving text messages, you know, of people saying, hey, we just need to get over you know, the president made a decision we need to execute. Hold, time out, okay? You've had men and we've lost 2,400 men and women in the Afghan conflict, okay? We've had others severely wounded. We've had, you know, and I tell this to people all the time, and those folks that are kind of criticizing us that are still having this conversation like you and I haven't, haven't had the business end of a ri enemy rifle you know, kind of staring them in the eye, or they haven't had to kill an enemy fighter, or their battle buddy next to them, who was a beautiful human being, in one explosion, all of a sudden becomes a pile of flesh, hair, and camouflage material. They don't have skin in the game, mm -hmm. and and they they are huge supporters of the president, regardless of what he does. So instead of saying, "Man, I I, I need to understand how these." veterans and, and, and the service members and their families are feeling. Instead, they say something stupid like, hey, just get over it. The president made a decision, meaning like Afghanistan's in the rearview mirror. Now we're moving on to the next thing I can. And you know this firsthand, brother, Afghanistan ain't in the rearview mirror. It's no. going to steadily be out the front windshield and it's going to be uh, out the side windshields. And we're going to have to continue to get after it to make sure that our homeland is safe. And that's the thing, like, we, you know, you hear these, you, you, you hear stories already of where we're going to have bases for Overwatch now for Afghanistan. These troops aren't coming home. <laughs> so right. Anybody who <laughs> thinks that all of a sudden their, their next door neighbor's kid is going to come walking through the door and they're going to be stationed only in the United States from now on. It's just not reality. They're going back to places like I went. They're already talking to Uzbekistan. So they're sending yeah. people back to toxic waste dumps to go get toxic exposure again because that's the only place yeah. we can go. They're going back to Manus. They're going to Saudi Arabia. They're going to go to Kuwait. We're going to start talking to Turkey again. We're going to do all these things. We're not coming back. You're just right. redeploying. That's all you're doing. I mean, and, and if you look at it like this, and I've said this before, and I'm critical of most of the past presidents we've had recently, uh, including Biden, but we were down to 2,500, like you said. Well, yeah. now we're at over 6,000. <laughs> so did we really draw down or did we go back up? I mean, what's reality here? Well, and I will tell you what, what pisses me off about that is, you know, we went in a hurry from calling it a withdrawal to a non-combatant evacuation operation. Yep. I did extensively when my time in the 82nd Airborne Division, we constantly prepared for non-neo exercises. Mm -hmm in terms of getting people out. And then when I was at US Forces Korea as the senior enlisted leader there, NEO was something that we practice all the time. But when you do a non-combatant evacuation operation, the order of stuff to go out is American citizens, mm -hmm. displaced American citizens, uh, host nation, trusted individuals yep. that have supported us, and then third country nationals that wanna get out then we get the equipment out. Then we get the troops out. We did this ass backwards and took the troops out, left the AMSITs in there and the Afghanis that supported us. And then all of a sudden now we had to bring, as you just described, 6,000 troops back in, soldiers, Marines, airmen, and sailors back in to do this non-combatant evacuation operation. When if we would have had a plan or executed a normal neo plan the way it's done we would have had a protracted withdrawal of american citizens and our afghan uh, 
allies that we needed to get out. We would have had a plan to get the equipment out. And then at the end, we would have got the troops out. But the minute we took the troops out first, and we said right off the bat, we, we even gave our, our intentions of what we were going to do. Um, and then that empowered the Taliban. But more importantly, it kind of decimated the Afghan national uh, security forces and, uh, and the government. And, and so here's where we're at now. And and like you said, we can see where it's already going to go. It's going to be a haven for terrorism again. Al Qaeda is going to settle right in, even though they say that ISIS and the Taliban don't get along. It doesn't matter. You don't have to get along. Yeah. If your common enemy is the United States, the yeah. enemy of my enemy is my friend. I mean, it's one of the oldest sayings in the book. So <laughs> you harbor them. You don't have to be friends. Uh, don't invite me over for tea. But if I can build a base right. there and recruit, and how many Afghans are going to be pissed off at the United States because we just walked out the door and left them there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I agree with you. You're, you're, and you're creating the recruiting poster for them. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. So, you know, so now, you know, and I continue to hear this. People say, hey, there's going to be enough time for after actions reviews and, and blaming game. OK, I got that. But you cannot. Um, criticize the American public and the American citizens for wanting answers on what happened here. Okay. Yeah. We cannot just say, well, well, there'll be plenty of the time for that later on. Okay. I got it, but we can, you know, walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. We can continue to conduct the non-combatant evacuation operation now and support those 6,000 ish mm -hmm. troops that are there and, and assist. Like I know you're doing a lot of work, to help our Afghan allies get out and everything. We can do that. And we can also be accountable for why we're in this situation we're in before, you know? Yep. And I, I really upsets me when I hear leaders say, there'll be plenty of time for that later on. Like, I don't have time to figure out how we screwed up because I'm so focused on this, you know? That's I something think a parent are, says to a kid. That's something yes. a parent says to We'll talk <laughs> about this when we get home. <clears throat> Yeah. You don't talk to your buddy like that. You don't talk to your, your peer to peer counterpart like that. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think the, what we do now is yes, we do have to support those troops that are there mm -hmm. and, and then continue to support on how we can uh, get our Afghan, our U S citizens out and our Afghan partners and any others that supported our 20 year effort, get them out, you know, and, uh, and, and, continue to get after that. Um, but again, we, we got to have leaders have to be accountable. Yeah. And you know, the other thing, and what kills me is the blame game. A leader doesn't play rugby with blame. You know, they don't pitch it to this person who pitches it to that person. And pretty soon somebody lower down the level ends up, oh yeah, we'll blame it on them. A leader stands up and says, I own it. And it's on my watch, it's been jacked up. And when I heard the president talking about, he wanted to blame the previous administration. He wanted to blame the Afghans. He, he blamed everything but his, himself as the leader. Yeah. And then in mid-sentence, you know, he stops and says, the buck stops with me. You know, like, okay, now I, now I am taking accountability or, or responsibility for what's going on now. No, you, you, your decision was made on 14 April. OK, right. and so he owned it. And I hear this all the time from people. Well, the plan was Trump's plan. OK, so what? It was Trump's plan. The execution belongs to the current president of the United States. And in my opinion, not speaking on behalf of the DOD or anybody in uniform, in Troxel's opinion as a veteran retiree and citizen, we screwed this up royally. Yeah. And I, I always have a hard time, and I've already had many conversations with friends, family, and they'll be like, well, this was Trump's plan. And my response to that, and, and I wasn't a Trump fan. I, I've said it on right. the show before. I'm not, I'm not a Biden fan. I'm not a fan yeah. of either one, to be honest with you. Um, I can't really think of a president that I've been a huge fan of recently. Um, but my answer to that is, okay, Trump also had an immigration plan that you reversed, um, an economic plan that you reversed, um, you know, uh, tax cuts that you're trying to re uh, reverse. You reversed a lot of his plans. 
why is it okay oh, yes. that this one will we had to see through to the end because it was Trump's plan? No, that's not an excuse. Yeah. <laughs> you executed it. You decided to continue on. And I don't want to, again, I'm not blaming any one individual because this is something that has been going on since hell, the Reagan administration with, yeah. you know, arming the Taliban because we didn't like the Russians. Um, you know, we, we now have a bed that we have to lie in. Um, and unfortunately, our leadership has kind of failed us along the way. And I think what's so hard for so many veterans is, is when we see these leaders get on the TV, when we see, you know, the Secretary of Defense, uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Secretary of State, they get on the TV and there's not a clear message. I think that's really hard for veterans. And also, we don't know what they're going through. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you. Yeah. Is maybe you can kind of give us a little insight into why we're hearing the things on these podiums from these high ranking individuals that don't jive in our heads. Yes. Yeah, so I know secretary Austin and general Milley very well. Yes. My last five months as a SEAC general Milley was the chairman. He was my boss. Mm -hmm. uh, general Austin was my brigade commander in the 82nd airborne division in the nineties. Uh, he was my core commander in combat. So I fought with both of these gentlemen and I know them very well. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't agree with everything they're doing or saying right now, but having been the SEAC and seen um, how policy by an administration, and again, this goes back to when a decision is made as a leader, you own it. And not mm -hmm. only do you own it, you speak in the first person about it. So I think when this is all said and done and, and when maybe Secretary Austin or General Milley aren't in position anymore. We may hear them say, hey, look, we tried to go with a plan, uh, the plan that we wanted to go with, the president vetoed or whatever and said, we're going to go this way. The minute the president makes a decision and says execute, then the secretary of defense and the chairman are bound. Now, I will tell you, I heard something from General Milley the other day when a reporter asked him a question and he said, that would, that's a policy decision. Mm -hmm. To me, that knowing General Milley like I know him, that's his kind of professional way of saying, hey, look, it, you know, it was my decision, but I own it now. And yeah, so I, I have to execute. execute it. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I see how, you know, what's coming out of the administration and what's coming out of Secretary or Defense Department and, and, and State Department isn't jiving and everything. But I think... Uh, when some decisions are made by the administration, I know from the Secretary of Defense and Chairman's perspective, they own it now. And you're not going to hear any one of those two gentlemen say anything else other than this is what we're going after. And, you know, Secretary Austin even said the other day, I support the president's decision. Why is he saying that? I don't know if he truly supports it or not. But being the professional as he is and the boss makes a decision, he's going to execute it and he's going to own it. So. I give both of those gentlemen props for owning it, you know, and taking it on. Um, how we got here and everything, we'll figure that out in the end. But uh, um, I think you're spot on. There is just uh, some disconnect between the three. And, you know, when I heard the Secretary of State, um, you know, talking about Americans uh, need to find their way to the airport, okay, that briefs well, okay? Mm -hmm. But when you, if you're a, a, a U.S. citizen and you're in Kandahar or Herat or Jalalabad or something like that, and, you, and you're telling them, get to Hamid Karzai Airport in Kabul, Kandahar, that's a 10-hour drive yeah. through, through some of the roughest terrain and the most infested Taliban and Haqqani network terrain to, on Highway 1 to get up to Kabul or from Herat, it's the same way, you know? So when you say get there, that's easier said than done. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when, when I hear things like that, it really concerns me. And then when I hear things that we're negotiating with the Taliban, a terrorist group, and now I just saw this morning, uh, the Taliban says, uh, if we're there beyond 31 August, uh, there's going to be some problems. All bets so, are off, basically, is the way they absolutely. Kind of put it. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and, you know, 
that's the other thing that I don't like is we have given a seat at the table to an organization that is by all means just broken every moral rule, ethical uh, uh, structure that the United States has ever had. And, and listen, we've broken our own along the way with certain things as well. But when I see people, you know, out in the streets of the United States, you know, the Me Too movements, Black Lives Matter, any of these people that are fighting for all these different things, how can you then give a seat at the table to the Taliban who, like you said, if they're not sexually assaulting women, they're yeah. selling them, they're making them sex slaves, they're brides, uh, you know, uh, sold into marriage, um, they're not allowed to read or write, they have to cover up their heads. It yeah. doesn't jive. These things aren't kind of uh, uh, working together in the in the in the I, I, the rhetoric, I guess, is is the term to use. You know, it doesn't. Work. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it was just a few weeks ago that the president said he doesn't trust the Taliban. Yeah. You know? yeah. And uh, you know, and and now all of a sudden we have to negotiate with this hideous terrorist organization that is completely counter to the values of. Completely being an American. Yeah. And so, um, but again, you know, this is where we're at now. And if the commanders on the ground have to negotiate with this terrorist organization to get Americans and our trusted Afghans into the airport and get them out of the country, it is what it is. I, I've said this before, and I've, I've done this in combat. Sometimes you have to sink to a certain level of hell to get progress. Yeah. In Iraq and Afghanistan, we have had to deal with some shady individuals uh, that uh, might have been criminals. They might have, you know, been terrorists themselves, but they were anti-Al Qaeda, anti-ISIS, anti-Taliban, and so we had to, uh, you know, do some work with them in order to have the desired effect we were looking for. Yeah. It doesn't mean, you know, the criminal patronage networks are the key ones that we've had to deal with. You know, those that. We're growing the poppy and we're making money off of heroin and everything, but they wanted to protect their investment. So they were more than willing to help us out at getting after Al Qaeda and the Taliban. Yeah. So my point in all of this is um, this is not uncommon that what we're doing right now, but generally that happens at the tactical level, at the strategic level and at the presidential level, where we have to negotiate with a terrorist organization shows you how far we have gone in a direction that we shouldn't be going in our country right now. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely agreed. And I think that's the thing that so many veterans are really struggling with, especially those that have deployed to Afghanistan, even the ones that have deployed yeah. to Iraq, because they know what goes into this. They know the sacrifice. They know the sacrifice of their Afghan counterparts, the special operations guys that now have to leave their wives at home to go now try to fight the Taliban. And the Taliban's not going after the special operations guy. They're going right. after the wives and children in their house so that those men can't concentrate. They're worried yeah. about something behind them. And as somebody who's deployed, when you're worrying about back home, your mind isn't where it needs to be to Absolutely. kick that door in and be on the tip of the spear to be the man that needs to take hold of that mission. Um, so Absolutely. It's tough. Uh, yeah. You know, one of the main reasons, like I said, that I wanted to have you on the show was, is I, I, I wanted to have an opportunity to have some type of a message go out to the veteran community at this, at this tough time, people that might be dealing with, uh, you know, seeing what they're seeing on TV, people that are maybe getting messages from people on the ground in Afghanistan and they feel helpless. I know you have another appointment to go to after this, but I wanted to give you one opportunity. What, from your leadership perspective, from, John Troxel, you yourself, eTool Nation, everything that you've built since you've gotten out. What is something that you would say to the veteran community to kind of help put everything into perspective for them? Be proud of your service. Um, be proud of what you've done. And don't forget your experiences. The more that people try to bury uh, this stuff, you know, when, when I hear comments like, just get over it, you know, that, you know, post-traumatic stress and post-traumatic stress disorder are real conditions that affect our veteran population every day. And in some cases, it affects them so bad 
that suicide is a reality. And we know this from, you know, the 22 a day that commits suicide. To our veterans, all the veterans out there, whether you've served in Afghanistan or Iraq or, or you've served your country, be proud of your service yeah. because we made an impact over 20 years. And I kind of use that football analogy. We took the ball off our own one yard line with the Afghans and pushed it all the way down into the red zone against the Taliban. And you, as much as we are upset that we were pulled off the field when we were in the red zone and, and ready to get in and get the winning score and we left the field and allowed the Taliban to go the other direction unopposed for 90 yards for a touchdown. Still, we made a huge impact out there. And if I could, I would like to, so we mentioned my counterpart, the, the Afghan Sergeant major of the army. And yes. he went on to, as we built the air force here, he became the first Afghan SEAC. And when everything started going south, um, now his background, Rashan Safi is his name. He is a Tajik and he is not, so he's not Pashtun like the Taliban. Like the Taliban, yeah. Plus, plus he's one of Masood's guys, you know, that fought against the Taliban. And third, for 20 years, he has been fighting and killing the Taliban. So he's got three strikes against him to begin with. And he would have been one of the guys that the Taliban would have beheaded first. And for through the help of retired Sergeant Major Gerald Parks, retired Sergeant Major Frank Grippy, the current SEAC, the current CENTCOM senior enlisted leader, um, and all the work that we've done, we were able to get Rashan, his family, and everything to Cutter. And he sent me a message the other day, an audio message that I would like to play. Oh, please. If you don't mind. Oh, please. Uh, let me let me figure out if if you'll be able to hear this. Uh, Okay, let's see. Hey, brother, thank you very much. They are inside. I want to tell you the good news, brother. Thank you, thank you, thank you for each of you. You work a lot, 24 plus 7. You murdered us up, and, and Gerald and everybody, Claire, to, you know, to all of them, trust, all of the teams from me, especially you were telling me I can make happen, you made happen. The help of me, my family, my kids, you, you saved my life, so my family, brother. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. They are inside. They are with the great American soldier. It's amazing. It's amazing. You know, here is a guy that now he was at the top of the Afghan military and one of the most revered and respected fighters that country has ever had. In an instant, he's nobody. And he is, if the Taliban would have got a hold of him, his life wouldn't have been worth spit. Uh, they would have probably did some pretty bad stuff to his wife and yeah. his daughter. And now his entire family is in Qatar and they are going to get their, their SIVs will get them into the United States. And he's going to be able to start a new life here. That's what I, my message to the veterans are is that none of this was in vain because we gave hope and we gave, uh, you know, opportunity to thousands of Afghans that never would have had it under Taliban rule. And uh, we're going to continue to do things to get them, those that helped us out of the country and get them a new life and continue to give them hope. So to all the veterans out there, be proud of who you are and what you've done. And I don't give a shit what the media says or any person that hasn't had any skin in the game, doesn't understand what the business end of a rifle is, doesn't understand what loss is, when you lose a comrade in arms, whether it's U.S. multinational or Afghan, and doesn't understand what it means to take an enemy fighter's life in defense of your country, freedom, and our way of life, don't listen to them. Be proud of who you are and what you are, and be proud to walk around and say, I am a veteran of the United States military. I serve, and I serve proudly, and in, in, in tell everybody else to go to hell. That's because right. this was not for naught. We, we made a huge impact. And I, I will tell you, I, I called it the proverbial 10 yard, or, you know, the, you know, analogous 10 yard line we were at. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it, maybe it was the 20 yard line, maybe it was the 30, but in my opinion, we were in the red zone, things were going in the right way. And we got the opportunity taken out from under us, but we, as the United States military are going to continue to push on those 6,000 that are on 
Kabul airport are going to do a job and they are going to thrive in that environment. And we will continue to have the most trusted military in the world and the number one partner of choice globally for peace and security. So all veterans that have served, be proud of who you are and what you've done. Uh, I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. It's something that I'm trying to put out there. I'm trying to share stories just like the one you just shared. Um, I posted one to my story right before uh, we went on uh, about uh, a gentleman who actually got his interpreter out and he posted a video of them in Qatar um, saying thank you to everybody that helped. So there are good people out there doing great things. We're going to continue to highlight them, including what uh, Siak Troxel just talked about. Um, please. Listen to what the SEAC is saying. This is important. You are a veteran of the greatest military that has ever walked the face of the earth, and your service was is never in vain, even if it was the smallest thing or you were the heaviest door-kicking, bombing son of a bitch ever made. It doesn't make a difference. You were part of something greater than any one individual. Um, so, uh, John, thank you so much for coming on the show. Like I said, I know you have another appointment to get to, and I want to give you the opportunity to do that. Um, it's been a, a, just a pleasure to have you on the show again. Um, where can people find you just if they want to reach out? Okay, so um, I'm on all social media platforms. There's a ton of fake John Troxels out there, okay? okay? So make sure you get the right one. But if you're on Facebook, go to my eTool Nation page and join mm -hmm. it. The eTool Nation page is now a page about like-minded individuals that are proud to be an American. They are proud uh, to serve their country. They're proud veterans, but they're people that are focused on doing great stuff, whether it's in the military or in their life and supporting each other, getting after it. Um, also, uh, PME Hard Consulting, PMEHard.com is my website. Go, in the, go on there. Um, we have our eTool Nation Apparel line on there, but also you will see some of these stories that we talked about here about the great stuff that we're doing and getting our Afghan brothers and sisters out. Uh, so find me on social media, follow me. And uh, I would love to hear from all the veterans or anybody out there on anything. Cause I'm, I'm just looking to help in any way I can. Yeah. I think like so many of us are. So, uh, but thank you so much again. Uh, it's been a blast talking to you and it's great to hear uh, a leadership perspective on all of this. And I hope that it's helped other people kind of understand what's going on. Um, so for Bulletproof Veteran Podcast, thank you so much. Thank you. Much appreciated. All right. All right so you have a good day. <laughs>